When Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez unseated Joseph Crowley back in 2018, you know, it was really easy for the pundits and the Democratic Party establishment to try to dismiss that, downplay it, make it seem as if it's a fluke and it's not going to happen again. But now, after the night that progressives had, I mean, you can't dismiss this. You can't pretend as if what happened in 2018 was an anomaly because now we have more progressives winning their races and yes, unseating incumbent Democrats. And if they didn't win, they came close to unseating incumbent Democrats, as was the case with Carolyn Maloney. Um, and we had, of course, Jamal Bowman beat Elliot Engel. We had Mondaire Jones win his primary, Qasem Rashid win his primary in Virginia's first congressional district. Uh, you can argue that Richie Torres is a fairly progressive individual. I don't know as much about him. I don't want to prejudge too much, but you know, you can make the case that he is a progressive if not, you know, a Bernie type Democrat, at least a Warren Democrat. So we're winning a lot more races. And we haven't even touched on all of the victories that progressives have had around the country in state house races and city council races like socialists are rising. The left in general is surging and you can no longer downplay it. But guess what? MSNBC is still going to try because in this clip that I'm going to play for you, they talked about these victories. They talked about the success of Charles Booker, even if we don't necessarily know the results yet. And watch the way that they try to explain away this as kind of, you know, not necessarily a sign of a new trend, but instead, you know, not that. <laughs> take a look. For who will take on Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell in November is too close to call right now between Amy McGrath and Charles Booker. <clears throat> McGrath leads by about 2,000 votes at this point. They're still counting. In New York, two Democratic incumbent seats could be in jeopardy in the state's 12th congressional district primary. Democratic incumbent Carolyn Maloney, who chairs the Oversight Committee, is narrowly leading challenger Shiraj Patel. And in New York's 16th congressional district, Democratic primary, longtime Congressman Elliot Engel, who chairs the Foreign Affairs Committee, trails progressive Jamal Bowman there. Casey, what are the surprises you see in these races and Democratic races across the country last night? So I think it's it's tempting to read this as, you know, progressives have uh, in that, you know, voters are looking for somebody that's that's more progressive. that's not part of the establishment. I think it's a little bit of a mistake to look at it that way. I think it's a rejection of the calcification of, of our politics of people that have been in office for decades. In many cases, I, the Kentucky race is fascinating, and it, we still have a lot of counting to do in that race. It really could right now go either way. Uh, but the, the turnout in that primary election shattered uh, previous records, and Charles Booker it was someone who caught on to this last minute energy really was a part of the protests that were swelling in Louisville uh, around Black Lives Matter. And I think really showed how you can, you, you don't have to operate inside the systems that have been built again. And that's kind of the, the trend that I see here is voters <coughs> looking at these candidates and saying, I don't want to be told what to do. I don't want to be told who to vote for. And it, while, you know, we've talked so much about Kentucky, and I still think it's incredibly unlikely that Mitch McConnell would lose this race in Kentucky, it is true he is incredibly unpopular, and it is also true that this is a pretty unpredictable outcome. I mean, they've been running against Amy McGrath for a year, and I think that given the current environment, it's going to be tricky to figure out if, if Charles Booker wins this race, Mitch McConnell is going to have to figure out how to run against a young <laughs> African-American man who has captured a lot of excitement and seems to be expanding his appeal beyond, you know, the traditional centers of, of Louisville and Lexington that a Democrat would vote for. They're, they're you know, they are looking at, at Appalachia and we'll see if that's actually real. But uh, a lot of mm -hmm. trends going on here that I think should make Republicans nervous. And, and Reverend Al, I'm curious, what, what, are, what are your takeaways for, from the races uh, from North Carolina to Kentucky to New York? I think that more than a uh, rebellion against just the uh, candidates or, or the incumbents that have served for decades is that they're facing candidates that represent the spirit of the times and that symbolize the issues that are prevalent in people's minds because there are many veterans that were reelected or renominated yesterday. So I think that we shouldn't confuse the, uh, the two or three that seem to be upsets 
with that it's based on a, a new form of leadership with a leadership that identifies with the issues of now. Every one of these, if you look at the Engel race and the other races, were people that were involved and symbolized, as we see in Kentucky, the actual issues that people are caring about now. And that's what the veterans missed. So, you know, credit to Al Sharpton for coming in with the most common sense and reasonable take on this. Voters want candidates who are going to represent them. The Democratic Party establishment has unequivocally failed at doing just that. Now, what she said, I believe that was Casey Hunt. She said, it's tempting to read this as voters are looking for someone that is more progressive. I think it's a mistake to think of it that way. It's a rejection of people who have been in office for decades. I mean, okay, fair. You can you can say that. But why are voters rejecting people who have been in office for decades? It's because they're not progressive, because they are looking for people who are more left-leaning, more progressive. So, you know, they try to find ways to get around the obvious conclusion. Well, it's not necessarily that people support left-wing policies. It's because the people who are getting beat, they've just been in power since 1940, and we they, they want some new blood. No, that's not what it is. People want left-wing policies. Left-wing policies happen to be incredibly popular. Medicare for all, a Green New Deal. These are all policies that a majority of Americans support, and some polls show that a majority of Republicans now support Medicare for all because guess what? It's a common-sense policy during a pandemic. But she goes on. She says, uh, with regard to Booker's race, it showed how you can... You don't have to operate inside the systems that have been built. And she kind of caught herself and she said, and the trend that I kind of see here is voters looking at these candidates and saying, I don't want to be told what to do. I don't want to be told who to vote for. So basically what she's suggesting is that this isn't necessarily about policy. This is about voters rebelling, telling the establishment, don't tell me what to do. <laughs> I mean, look, it's you're overcomplicating it. It's, it's much more simple. People like left-wing policies. There is a reason why in every single state, exit polls show that a majority of Democratic Party primary voters supported Medicare for All. Now, yes, Bernie Sanders lost. The candidate who supported Medicare for All lost, and the person who is against it won. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're against Medicare for All. What it means is that they believe the propaganda that your network was spewing, you know, saying that Joe Biden was the most electable. So, People want left-wing policies. You don't have to overcomplicate it. Um, but I will give her credit for kind of giving Charles Booker a little bit of credit by saying that he expanded his appeal because, I mean, this network has tried to downplay the appeal of left-wing politics for years. But ask yourself, why did Booker expand his appeal? Why was he able to expand his appeal in a deep red state like Kentucky? It's because he is speaking to issues that affect normal Americans. But, you know, they can't tell you what's obvious. They can't jump to that obvious conclusion because this network doesn't want to do anything that would jeopardize the current power structure in D.C. with regard to the Democratic Party. They don't want to, you know, admit even tacitly that the Democratic Party establishment is out of touch and they're deeply unpopular for a reason. They don't want to admit that because this is a network that is supposed to do propaganda at the behest of the Democratic Party establishment. So that's why we're seeing these types of weird analyses where they bend over backwards, you know, doing mental gymnastics, trying to explain this as, you know, not a new trend, but instead some sort of uh, fluke or alternative reason for all of these successes. No, it's because people like left-wing politics. It's that simple. It's just a matter of us trying to use the momentum and support for left-wing policies and actually grow the power that we have collectively on the left. So don't overcomplicate it. Um, we're winning because people believe what we're saying because it's common sense. People want healthcare. People want education. People want housing. We're winning because we're speaking to those very specific issues.